Before we get started with this week's show, I just wanted to say I jumped on the Owen the Saints podcast with Pat and Jack uh, immediately after the Bournemouth game, and uh, I appreciate them having me on the show. And if you haven't tried the show yet, if you haven't tried the Owen the Saints podcast, uh, I would I would look into it. I would I would attempt to get it in the rotation. Uh, they do a great job, and it was a lot of fun to be able to talk with them. Pat has been on this show before, and it's always a pleasure to get to, to be the guest on, on another show. So um, anyway, the link is in the show notes for that one if you want to try it, if you haven't listened yet. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy this show. And um, let's get to it. You're listening to the Southampton Delivery po- po- Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. If you want to have guarantees, you have to buy a washing machine. Okay, with the we don't lose a match, either we win or we learn. And today we learn. Adacha, Austin! Shot at his It's in field to Mane, 25 yards out. Lovely ball for Pella. Onside, 1-0! Blue fast shot! Like Bambi on ice, it would be very, very embarrassing to watch. And now, and now, now. Your, host, your host, Matt Markstone. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast and newsletter dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans and available right here on SouthamptonDelivery.com. My name is Matt Markstone. I am the host of the show. And no matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thanks for making the show part of your day. I hope that you enjoy it. And there's really, you know, not much that we can complain about, uh, maybe except for a challenge or two that happened in the game. Uh, that would be directed at Mr. Surridge, who I don't even want to call Mr. And who, if I had been in the stadium may have had a few choice words for him, for what he chose to do, uh, to Mohamed Salisu, which I still do not think he would do to his face. I just don't think he would. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, we're not gonna let that get us down. Um, as I said, and I say at the beginning of every episode, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thank you for making the show part of your day, for choosing to listen. And after four and a half years and, you know, some serious ups and downs, um, the show has surpassed 100,000 downloads, which I never thought would happen. Uh, especially when the first episode in the first week got somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20. Um, most of those from my mother and, you know, now, it, you know, it's obviously doing a, a lot better than that if you measure success by numbers, which I, I don't necessarily do. But um, when I logged in to kind of get things ready for this episode, I saw that it was over the 100,000 download mark. And that means a lot. So thank you to all of you. I mean, there are, there are shows out there who get 100,000 downloads per episode, but that's that's not what this show is about. Um, the, you know, the about the 400 of you who download this episode every week. Um, uh, that means a lot. So thank you to all of you. And, uh, I, I think we'll all watch the team go into Wembley for the semifinal, uh, smiling, hopefully, uh, depending on what happens between now and then. And, uh, of course we'll watch the internationals and we'll come back and hopefully get some wins in the premier league between now and then. But yeah, as of right now, as of this episode, lots and lots of smiles. And uh, I hope that you agree with that. And I hope that you were smiling too. And I think that after you listen to this interview with Tom Leach, who is a reporter, uh, covering Saints for Hampshire Live. Um, I'm probably still saying that wrong, and I apologize. I, I get way too worked up about the proper way to say it, and then I screw it up, and I also just watched Lord of the Rings, so I don't know. Um, anyway, I just want to say thank you to, to you. Thank you to Tom. Uh, if you don't follow Tom already, all of his Twitter handles and links uh, to all of his articles and stuff are in the show notes, and I would encourage you to check it out. He's doing a great job. Um, it's a small operation in terms of, of manpower, but, uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you couldn't tell by looking at the website and, and everything that they have going on. So, uh, we'll jump into it with Tom now. And, uh, I just want to say thank you again. And I will talk to you on the other side. I'd like to welcome to the Southampton delivery podcast, Tom Leach. You can find him on Twitter at Tom Leach HL, uh, Tom, uh, from Hampshire live. And, uh, thanks for joining me ahead of the cup draw. Uh, ahead of your week off for the international break, but uh, welcome to the show. And uh, how are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's good to um, 
good to get on and speak to some more Southampton fans and talk Southampton, I guess, instead of instead of typing it and putting it into print all the time. So yeah, it's good to um reflect on a win, which is always a positive. And uh yeah, look ahead to a week off for myself and um a couple of international games as well. Yeah, you you almost would have hoped that this international break would have come, you know, in, in four or five weeks time for you personally, because then maybe you can actually, you know, go outside the house on your week off instead of uh sitting around. But it, it, at least it's a little bit of um it's, I don't know, a little bit of a, a respite from the, I guess, just the, the pace of this season, which has had to be, you know, rough for you because it's it's probably, you know, you're trying to do not just match reports or, or, or pre-match kind of, uh, you know, uh, press conference summaries. You're trying to do, you know, longer articles and, and interviews. And I, I can't imagine the pace you've had to work at this season. It must have been, have been tough on you as much as it has been on the players and the managers, probably. Yeah, it's, it's been hectic. It's been... You know, I don't think people maybe realise sometimes how long match days are. I mean, even yesterday, um, even the, the, the game away at Bournemouth was, I mean, I set off at uh, quarter to eight in the morning, um, got back at about eight at night, I think, or, or seven at night. And then you're working pretty much the rest of the evening, getting everything set for the Sunday, which is just another big day of people being off work and wanting to read about Southampton. So, yeah, there's, there's so much to do. There's interviews thrown in there. There's player interviews manager interviews. I did a um, long read with Andrew Sermon as well, ex Southampton player, looking ahead to the game. So yeah, it, it's hectic and it's even worse when it's Tuesday, Saturday or Wednesday, Monday, Thursday. I mean, the games this season seem to have been all over the place, which isn't something I was really used to before this season. For those who don't know, I covered Coventry City for years, um, who when you're not in the Premier League, you don't really play on Mondays or Sundays, you play on Saturdays. So you can get a little bit of routine going there. Mm. Um, in the Premier League, the games get moved to stupid o'clock, random times, it's 12.15 or it's 2.30 or it's 5.45. And yeah, that's not something I was ever really used to. Um, it just messes with your sleep pattern and your working hours. And But yeah, it's, it's going to be good to get a little bit of a break. I think last year, because uh, of the pandemic and working through that i mean i ended the year with about 15 holiday days unused and they've all carried over so i've got a lot to use so i'm going to try and make the most of the international break and then yeah do the same through the summer yeah well i mean it becomes hard to use those days when when the games are getting moved and you know you kind of i've noticed the the you know the guys who cover specific teams when the international breaks come it seems like you know that you're off a week, you know, you get, you could probably get four weeks in the fall because there's so many breaks or three weeks in the fall because there's so many breaks. And then there's this, this long stretch of, of time where there's no time off and it's just, you know, this kind of frantic pace. And then now you're going to get one and then it's a run to the end of the season. And then, you know, you probably have to wind up covering, uh, you know, preseason that'll happen too, not too long after that. But, um, you you mentioned that the game's getting changed. This season has been especially, uh, it's rough for that for, for fans because, Normally, I can I can look at the schedule and say, okay, you know, Arsenal are in the Europa League, uh, you know, or or this team's playing on on Wednesday in, in the Champions League, so they're going to play whatever. And you know, you kind of can see when the games are going to change. Um, this year, because they've tried to you know put everything on TV, so they're trying not to schedule games over the top of each other. Um, you know, five fifteen a.m., four fifteen a.m., four thirty a.m. kickoffs for us, or or noon kickoffs for us on a, on a weekend, which is just totally weird. Um, but I can only imagine what it's like for you. Uh, you know, trying to make, you know, arrange, uh, well, I think you drive to most games, but, you know, arrange train timetables and things like that. Uh, it just seems like a, a nightmare. But um, what, what's your, what's your uh, preferred kickoff time uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a working journalist on, on a match day? So I was thinking yesterday, the 12.15 was quite nice, okay. to be fair, because, I mean, 3 p.m.s are, are okay, because that's kind of when, when we at the start of the season when we plan out what we're going to do on a match day, we normally design it around at 3 p.m. because it's normally the most common for our clubs that we cover. So that's okay. The 8 p.m.s are pretty horrible. Um, when I think of the Liverpool win back in January, uh, I was still working at about 3.30 or 4 in the morning in, in a hotel room after that game, just tapping stuff out, getting things set for the morning because I knew I was going to have to sleep. So... Yeah. Um, going to sleep and waking up pretty early and finishing the rest of the day because I had a long drive home. I don't actually, I don't live in Southampton at the minute because of the whole pandemic. I've not had a chance to even move down there yet. So I still live in Coventry. Okay. Um, so I'm also factoring in two hour drives for home games, which isn't ideal. I think the 12 o'clock games are quite good because it normally means I can get home in time to have dinner, which is a bonus. 
Um, okay. If I was to stick it, I'd pick that one. But you can't beat a 3pm. I think 3pm is when fans come back will be the best one. Um, yeah. I guess the bonus at the minute is there's no fans there, so kickoff times, it, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, 3pm is the best when fans are back, though. They're normally the best atmospheres. Yeah. I'm just looking at a, at a map because I'm a typical American. I'm like, I'm very familiar with where London is and where Southampton is. Uh, and the, uh, the rest of it is, is, is different. Um, so I'm looking not far from uh, where, I guess, Che Adams was playing not long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Che Adams used to play for Coventry when he was younger. So okay. um, me and Che are from pretty much the same spot. Easiest way to find Coventry, it could not be more in the middle. We've got a thing near us in Exhall, which is the middle of, of the UK. Okay. So could not be more in the middle. Just him right in the middle. Right in the middle. Throw, like, it's the bullseye if you're throwing a dart at it. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, I, I'll, in that case, I would never hit it. But, you know, uh, <laughs> it's just the way it goes. Um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit before we get into Saints, because obviously we have a, a win to talk about, which has, has been been rough in 2021. Um, but you've covered Coventry city in the past, but what role did kind of football or just sport in general play growing up? Were you, did you play football or did you play other sports or, or were your parents kind of into it or did you just kind of watch or what was that, what was that like growing up? Yeah, I played football my whole life basically. And like kind of Sunday league over here, they just the youth, I think they call it minor league in America. I'm not sure what they call it, but just kids football my whole life. A um, little bit of, um, go kart whenever I was free to. I used to enjoy that. My dad used to be a racing driver. Um, okay. Coventry, Coventry City was the club we used to go and watch every week growing up. So um, yeah, it was always football uh, above anything else. So it seemed logical that at some point I kind of find a job in it. Um, yeah. There's a there's a quote I really like from Murray Walker, who was a Formula One commentator over here. He uh, always used to say, "Those who can do it, do it, and those who can't do it, talk about it." So I fell into the talk about it category. Okay. Um, was never that good at football. I think that's the same with all journalists. We were probably all kids who really wanted to be footballers but weren't quite good enough. Um, so yeah, just made sense for me to transition into it. I went to university. I emailed the guy who ran Coventry City's Twitter account and said, how do I get your job? Um, and he <laughs> sent me a whole list of things I needed to do to get it. One of them was going to this one specific university. So I went to it, um, graduated from there and then got in touch with him again and he offered me down to work for them for a little bit. So covered them for the club and then moved over to cover them for the local newspaper. Okay. Um, did that for a few years. And then the opportunity came to come down to Southampton and do stuff in the Premier League. So yeah, it was really good. And I'm, I'm really happy that I'm down into that. I've really settled in well at the club. And and yeah, it's a, it's a good club. I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a similar size. It's not, it's not terrifyingly big. That makes sense in terms of it's not jumping to a Manchester United or jumping to cover in England. It's been quite nice to settle into it. And I think Coventry City are a bit of a sleeping giant. To be fair, I'm not sure how much of a memory you'll have of Coventry City or or how well they're known outside of the UK. But um, they spent 34, 35 years in the Premier League at one at one stint. And when they got relegated, it was Arsenal, Everton, and Coventry were the only three teams that had never been relegated. So they were a huge, huge club back then. But sadly, they've been in the lower leagues ever since. So in terms of fan base. It's been it's been pretty similar to jump over to Southampton. They're really similar sized clubs. It's just that now Southampton have got the demands of the Premier League and the the multi million pound players and mm -hmm. big stadium and, and and all that sort. So yeah, really good. as a journalist, when you're you're kind of being, I guess when you're working towards that, I mean you you cover you got to cover the team that you grew up kind of supporting, which has to be. It's fun. I mean, as I say that as a fan who does a, a podcast about the team I like, I would hate to do a podcast about a team I don't like, but I also have the ability to be completely biased when I want because, you know, I, I'm not a journalist I, and I, I won't claim to be one and, and I don't want to pretend to be one because that takes away from what you guys actually do. Um, but what was it like covering the team that you, you grew up supporting? Was that, did you find that difficult or was it, was it just kind of a, you were so familiar with it and maybe it made it easier? I don't know. How, how, did, how was that? I've never been the kind of person to see things from a fan point of view that sounds weird to say but I've never been that guy I mean I, I think back to the university there was there were some people who couldn't look at their own club and say anything bad about their own club even if their own club was doing something bad and I was, I've never really been like that I've always been one to criticize and maybe see things from a more level playing field so I didn't find it too difficult to switch over um I think the the most daunting thing from covering Coventry City was that I would sometimes be at games and I'd see people, this name will mean absolutely nothing to you, but I would see people like Gary McSheffrey, who when I was little, that was like Danny Ings is to young Southampton fans now. So 
passing him in the stadium corridors or, or speaking to him before and after games was was like strange but really weird um he was my hero growing up so you know that's maybe not there with Southampton but I think one something that was maybe drilled into me at university especially by some of my tutors and lecturers there was that you can't be a fan and be a journalist you need to strip that away from yourself um and I really don't think my coverage of Southampton to be fair is any different to what it would have been for Coventry City I think there's still just as much of a wanting the club to do well I really do want Southampton to do well that's still there uh, and also kind of being able to say this wasn't good this was good and and look at it from a level playing field which I think is something that you need to have really to do this and when I look at the guys who are good at being a club writer up and down the country for football clubs they're all really good at that yeah um and then as you kind of go through it you you, you made the jump from from Coventry City to to, to covering Saints and, and you mentioned you, you stuff to do the drive because of um you know, pandemic and all that stuff but as you're kind of going through there are you looking I mean, much like Coventry City would be looking to get promoted to the next league, are you looking to to get promoted to to the next division above, or is the goal to move to a um, perhaps a larger uh, a club with a larger fan base? And in the way I think about Southampton's fan base is is it's definitely Southampton in in the surrounding area, pretty much a one club area, right? Like unless you get all the way down to Bournemouth or all the way over to to, to Portsmouth, like that's all Saints everywhere. Um, whereas some places in London, you know, you get this, this gigantic split between all these places and, and neighborhoods and then the people overlap and all that stuff. But, um, I mean, is, is the goal to get kind of promoted to the Premier League or is the goal to just, you know, find, uh, the sizing of a club that works or, or what, what, or is it not anything? It's just like, you know, journalism, you want a job and so you'll take it. It's a lot of the last point, a lot of the last point. Um, I'm not, just not really thinking really about, about things like that at the minute. I think it's just. I really like covering Southampton, so I'm going to do that for a long time. And the, the thing about this job sometimes is you don't get good at it until you're doing it for a long time. It takes a long time to build contacts and build trust from here and there. And the places you get stories sometimes take years to develop. And that's been one of the hardest things, I think, because you've got to leave those behind when you leave Coventry City. And almost all of your contacts are, are now useless because there's not, apart from Jack Stevens, there's, there's no Southampton players who've got really strong links to Coventry City. Uh, he had a tiny loan spell there a few years ago, and that's pretty much all there is. Um, I think it, it's it's interesting with Southampton and Coventry, the thing you mentioned there about being a one-club city, um, of teams that have won the FA Cup or, or been big Premier League teams. I mean, it's, it's Portsmouth, Southampton and Coventry are really the only one-club cities, because even Leeds have got Leeds Rhinos who play rugby league, and there's, yeah. there's splits there, and Manchester have two clubs, Liverpool, two clubs, London, so many clubs. I think it's strange how similar I think Coventry and Southampton actually are, which has made covering it very, very easy. And okay. yeah, I think everything's been really, everyone's been really welcoming for, for a first point. The club have been really good with me. They've helped me get player interviews at, at times when I've asked them. And a few of the former players have been really good at speaking to me as well. And I think Twitter's been really good, yeah. to be fair. I think Southampton seems quite a welcoming club on Twitter. I don't know whether people who are in the, in the pack agree with that, but yeah, it's been okay. It's, it's been good so far. And I think just, just doing the content that I do and just putting it out there and seeing if people like it and engaging from yeah. them. But I'm always keen to ask them, you know, what they want me to ask on match days or things like that. I think it's really important that, although I just spoke then about taking that fun element away from yourself, you've also got to be a fan in a way because you've got to be interested in what they're interested in. So you've got to listen to what they're keen, they're keen to ask. And that is something that I think really put me in good stead at Colf. So I'm just trying to replicate that here. I, I think uh, you spoke about Southampton being you know, pretty welcoming on Twitter. I agree with that. Um, you know, as a guy from California showing up and just saying, you know, I really like this club. I'm, you know, I've been following it for a couple of years and I'm going to try to do this. There's, there's no reason for anybody to, to listen to me, you know? Um, and so this has been a learning thing for me and, and getting to talk to people like you, um, getting to talk to just, just fans from around you know, the world really uh, is, is the best part of, of this. And I learned so much about the club and everybody's kind of unique um, history with it, whether it's, you know, uh, goes back to their grandparents or before that or whatever it is. It's just, it, it is kind of nice to to just kind of soak all that in and, and, and makes you feel a part of it a little bit. Um, I do want to ask you about, about uh, you work for Hampshire Live. Um, just if people aren't familiar, I, I know you do, you do play interviews. You had Andrew Sermon on uh, before the game, before the Bournemouth match, uh, who's, who's now playing for MK Dons. Uh, you just written a piece, I think in the last couple of, uh, the last week or so, uh, interview with Kyle Walker Peters. 
uh, you had you have pieces going up all the time. What types of things can people expect from you or from Hampshire Live if they uh, were to were to to come to the site or to follow on Twitter? What 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 what, what can people expect? So the, the the plan with Hampshire Live is to really offer Southampton fans somewhere where they can read everything about Southampton. So we push to do a lot a day. Sometimes it's an overwhelming amount of stories that we do a day. We do a lot um because we look to cover all bases as a conversation and we'll be that even if it's just sometimes we do things on here's what South Atlanta fans are saying today about this topic or or that um i think people in uk especially will be pretty familiar with with us in a way anyway even though we're a new site because uh we're part of reach plc part of the mirror group so we've got sites covering pretty much every club um around around the uk um all with live as the as the as the name of them um so we're looking really to replicate what we do with some of the other clubs at Southampton because there's never really been, we've never had a site down here ourselves. Um, from the site, we're looking to cover everything from me. Um, I'm looking to do just just good feature content, really. A lot of people who read my Andrew Sermon thing would have realised it was about 3,000 words. I think it was really long, way too long for print. One bonus with us is we don't have a print obligation. So a lot of the centres who cover clubs have got an actual paper newspaper to put out the next day. So right. if, if I submitted a 3,000 word story to that, they'd tell me to lose 2,000 words of it because it's just way too long. It's going to take yeah. a whole paper. So the good thing about us is we don't have that. So I can do long interviews on the site. I mean, that Andrew Sermon, I think it was about an hour um, of quotes I ended up with after that. And when I sat down with an hour of quotes, I thought, okay, this is this is too much. This is going to be about five, six stories worth if I leave it like this. So there was a lot left on the cutting room floor in a way. Um, but that's the thing to expect. I mean, we've got, we'll have another player interview next week. We're in every press conference. We speak to Ralph um, kind of one-on-one. It's in the, in the embargo bit of the press conference, the bit that doesn't go out. We, we speak to him one-on-one every week there after every game. So, yeah, there'll be a lot, a lot coming from us. I think the best thing to do would be, you already said my Twitter at the start, but I put all the real good stuff on my personal Twitter. So the features, the interviews and yeah, give them a good push from there. And then apart from that, we just try and interact with, with the fans as much as we can. Yeah, so when do you sleep? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, over the next week, I'll probably sleep the whole time to make up for the first kind of three months of 2021. Um, yeah, I mean, I was only saying a few a few days ago, when when this pandemic's over and I start seeing my friends again and, and being able to see my girlfriend more often, I'm going to be in a position where I'm going to have to think, okay, I'm going to have to slow down a little bit on the work, probably. Um, yeah. But yeah, we do a lot. Uh, there's uh, the, the mad thing about it as well. There's only really a team of two of us. There's there's me and, and a lad called John T who covers covers Portsmouth for the site. So it's just me and him. And then we've got Rob, who's really great above us, who, who helps out a lot and puts stories in for us on our days off and reads everything that we do to make sure it's of a good enough standard. So yeah, yeah we're, we're a small team um, and we do a lot. And I think we've been really impressed with each other i think so far since we've been doing it because each of us have done some really good stuff yeah yeah no um and and you also have you know you, you wrap up everything i think from your car on the way home or before you leave the car park or maybe when you when you stop to take a nap or whatever it is or food um so you do that after the match and then i, I watched a, a good portion of the andrew sermon uh interview just as i was kind of doing stuff around the house just listening and um i mean it, it's a lot and it's it's um I've I've learned just from listening. I try to listen to to you and to you know to Adam Leach when he was um, you know covering Saints and and Dan at the Athletic. I try to like you know just you, you start listening to the the timing you guys are on. It's just, it's that's absolutely insane. So I, I applaud you all for the work you do. And and if I were to try to do that, the 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 tail the the fall off and and, and the quality of work would be there. And and you don't have that. So congratulations. <laughs> Uh, and, and I hope it continues also, but also sleep because that's important. Um, anyway, uh, I, so you, we've kind of not talked about saints yet and, and it's important to me cause I like to get to know you a little bit and get to know you know, kind of the work as I'm interested in that stuff. And, um, but, but fans will definitely be interested in us hearing or talking about a win a little bit. Uh, the FA cup run has been great. Um, the league form, not so great. It's hard to, it's hard to figure out why why one is going so well and why the other is has kind of fallen off a cliff a little bit. Other than you know, maybe the the teams we put we've played, although we've played Wolves and Arsenal, weren't necessarily full strength. Bournemouth are in the championship, um, but I mean, what have you made of Saints Cup run up until this point? The Cup run's been it's been interesting, I think, because as you said, then I mean, we didn't play a full strength Wolves 
we definitely didn't play a full strength Arsenal. But I don't think you can take anything away from Southampton because of that. You can only play who you come up against. And also, it's not like a full strength Arsenal, a not, a not full strength Arsenal isn't a good side. Mm-hmm. It was still many, many millions, million pounds worth of talent in that, squ- in that squad. And it was a very good team. Even Wolves was the same. Even Wolves, you know, they brought on the Lama Ferrari and they, they, they still gave it their all. And yeah, it's, it's not like they're playing against lower league teams. Um, so I think the interesting thing about the contrast of form is, is, how, is how poor maybe the application has been in, in the league games. I mean, speaking to the manager yesterday after the game, he said, we put so much focus on the cup. He kind of jokingly said, maybe I should have put that focus on the league and then the league form would have been as good as it is the cup, which I don't think it's that simple, sadly. I think there's a real confidence issue there, whether it's bred from the 9-0 or whether it's bred from the games before that. There does seem to be a real confidence problem that, that, that they're working through. I don't think it's that they've all lost hope or that they, they wake up on the morning of games and they think they're not going to win. Speaking to Nathan Redmond after the game yesterday, he, he did his bit with the press and he said the morale's actually quite high, that they all, they're all still chirpy coming into training. They're also getting on. Uh, I think it's more of a, in the situation, in those one-on-one situations when you're face-to-face with an opposition player, I just maybe they don't think they've got the, the belief at the moment to, to do the job. And I think that it's more of a case of being scared to take risks because the punishment for getting it wrong is throwing. They're getting closer, closer to the bottom three. And that 9-0 game was must have been horrible to be on the pitch. I really feel for people like Kane Ramsey, especially people like that who shouldn't have been in that situation in the first place. Uh, and we're made to go through it. Um, but yeah, we won yesterday. So there's a lot of positives to talk <laughs> yeah. about. I, don't, I really don't want to turn this into a whole worry yeah. about the Premier League run. I think it'd be really good just to, to have a little spell where we actually celebrate, you know, uh, what was a good performance against a team who, I mean, I did an article this morning all about um, what changed in the week and and the, the changes that Hasn all did that he wasn't doing the weeks before and his search to find out why there's this kind of skid in form um and yeah it's it's we've won which is only the third time we've been able to say that this year um yeah. so yeah there are positives in it and i think it's just a shame that they can't now build on that straight away but they, they've got good games coming up very winnable games coming up as well and and saints have had kind of a a, a good run in cups over the last couple of seasons um league cup final made the semifinals of the fa cup uh previously um you know kind of not done well in the in the league cup since but these when you when you look at a team who like Southampton, who's probably not going to challenge for you know the top of the league, the Champions League places, uh, we can all dream of it. We we got a taste of what it's like to to be there, and and we probably celebrated too much, um, but that's okay. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fault anybody for that. I was right there with everybody doing that. Um, but you know, is I, I guess a cup run is that what Saints should be looking at? And you, you spoke a little bit about what how Hassan Hudel has prioritized it a little bit or put the put the the emphasis on it. I mean, that, that's what it's about. If you're not going to do that, then what are you really going to do, right? Yeah, especially in recent years, it does seem like, well, I say recent years, I mean, it's kind of been a thing for a long time now. The FA Cup is, is, a, is a bonus for clubs like Southampton, especially, Hasnickel has said the whole time he's been with Southampton that once he's happy that they're safe, which you can, you, you can forgive him for thinking that when it came to was, you know, December, January time. I mean, yeah. in the race for Europe more than anything. He was going to prioritise the cup, even if it did mean sacrificing a few points in the Premier League. And we saw him rest against Arsenal and Wolves in that strange doubleheader fix we had. We rested for the Premier League games and then we went all out for the cup games and he did say he was going to do that. Um, I think the FA Cup's really good for clubs like Southampton who, look, Arsenal, Chelsea, United fans, they're bored of winning. I mean, I think it's it's good for clubs like Southampton to give their fans something to to cheer about. And I'm sure that most Southampton fans would take survival in any way, as long as it's not a horrible nail-biting last day, as long as they're clear before the final few games of the season, um, even if it means they finish you know, 17th mm-hmm. and winning the cup. I mean, yeah. winning the cup is what, what we will tell our you know, kids and grandkids about over the few years. We don't, we don't talk about the year we finished in the top half. I mean, that's as good yeah. as that is, and that is a brilliant achievement. That's not the one we're going to remember forever. Winning the cup or a cup final is. Um, I just really hope that if they get through the semi-final, whoever it will be against, and I guess we'll talk about that later, but um, that there is fans who can go. I mean, looking at the roadmap over here, this roadmap that we've got out of the lockdown, um, it probably is going to be a few thousand at the final. 
Um, but any number at this stage would be brilliant. And yeah, yeah, I think winning the FA Cup is just, it's something to celebrate. It's something to remember for years and years. I mean, I'm sure that people, I'm sure that Southampton fans who are my age probably have to sit and listen to stories of 1976 all the time and they've not yeah. got their own stories to tell about. So it would be good to, to, to create those. Yeah, and there could be a big difference between fans and, and owners, right? Owners prioritize the league probably because that's where all the money comes from. Um, fans want that day, that that moment in in their fandom history or their club's history to be able to to talk about and hold on to. And I know, you know, speaking to people who were just at the League Cup final um, when when we lost to to, to Manchester United, um, you know, that day sticks in everybody's mind. Everybody remembers that day. Um, I mean, people want to talk less about the the semifinal uh, in the FA Cup when we lost to Chelsea. Uh, I just started drinking very early that day. It wasn't wasn't a fun morning, but um, you know it's it's uh, and I, I say early. I mean like I was watching from my home here in California, so it was like you know I think before eight a.m. I was I was pretty much done for the day. Um, but anyway, um, you know that that that's what we want. But uh, you know owners would have been like you know the millions of pounds you will lose if you you know you, if you fail to stay in the premier league is, is it would be devastating for them. And you know, w- whatever, it, it, it's just the, the difference that's there. We don't need to talk about that because we have good things to talk about. Um, especially, you know, not just the win and, and the progression of the cup, which is huge uh, for fans and in, in, in the club, but um, some of the players and, and Nathan Redmond has come up obviously over and over and over as being um, at least in that match against Bournemouth, just a completely different player. It seemed like for, for, for moments, but um top of my list for, for things that I wanted to talk about today uh, for you, what did you notice yesterday about him? Like that was, that was maybe a little bit different or was there anything? It was it just a, a chance for him to just show what he could do. I think it was interesting. I think it, uh, his performance yesterday was, um, was a good way to a, a good case study of what wins players man of the match awards. I don't think he was Southampton's best player on the day. But when it came to me doing my player ratings, he was the highest rated player because he did. He was the difference. He was he was the man who got the goals and the assists. Um, I don't think he's had it easy at all um, this season. Uh, I did see one of my one of my colleagues said to me after after the game that it was like he was rolling back the years, and I kind of thought to myself, he's twenty seven. I mean, we should be seeing the best of Redmond now. It shouldn't really be a case of him rolling back the years. Um, but he's just struggled this season. He, he had that injury early on that slowed everything down a little bit, um, and then he's just. Seems like he struggled to get up to up to full speed. I noticed something that I didn't notice when he said it at the time, but listening back to Hassan Hill, um, when I was listening back to his interview this morning, he did say along the lines of his fitness is still building up. So whether he has still been carrying something, like this whole whole run, but regardless of that, I mean he's he's moved from midfield to being a striker alongside alongside Danny Ings and now alongside Che Adams. So it's been a strange season for him, really. He's been he's been moving around the park a bit, but yeah, it was a it was definitely a good performance. I think the interesting thing is heading into maybe the thirty minute mark, it, it wasn't a good performance, and he was getting the usual stick mm-hmm. on social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he just decides to run at people, which is what he needs to do. Um, he's spoken about it himself before. He he spoke after the game about how he doesn't really know why he's not running at people like he should. Um, it just seems to be a confidence yeah. thing. And, and hasn't it all yeah. kind of said, um, as he spoke to the media after the game, that um, he doesn't want Redmond to be a, a one game a season player. He wants him to be a one game yeah. a week player, um, yeah. one good game a week. So it's all about running to people. It's all about him remembering what he's best at, his, utilizing his full strengths. And he really caused some problems when he did run at them, not even just for the, for the assist to Moose and, and the goal as well. It was, Whenever he ran at them, he caused them problems. And the same was true for, for Stuart Armstrong. But I think something big to talk about as well from, from yesterday was that it wasn't just about him individually. It was, it was almost the search for problem solving on the pitch. We can all talk all day long about how Hassan Hill needs to set them up to win the game. He needs to give them a game plan of how they can beat the opposition. But sometimes in football, you go into games with a game plan and it doesn't work. And I think the problem for Southampton over the last few weeks is when it hasn't worked, there's been no solving it on the pitch. There's been no players who change things up, who drop a little bit deeper or try something different. It seems to be if Yannick's long balls to Kyle Walker-Peters aren't working, then they freeze up a little bit. And if Yannick can't step forward and find Shea Adams with a direct pass, they freeze up a little bit and they don't really know how else to cause opposition teams any problems. Yesterday, 
the, the balls to Kyle weren't working, the direct balls to Jay weren't working as normal. But as the game went on, they got a little bit more comfortable. They tried different things and they realised that running up at Bournemouth caused them a big problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we saw in the second half that Redmond was doing it all the time. Stu Armstrong was doing it all the time. And that was how we beat them. So I think it's really good to see that progression of, of on-field problem solving that maybe isn't talked about enough in football. The players really took it upon themselves yesterday and they beat them convincingly in the end. From your perspective, Redmond, you mentioned he's moved from midfield to, to striker and, and you have to think that you know Che was kind of out of form. Ings is now injured. There is competition in those wide number 10 uh, or those inside 10 roles uh, or wide 10, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, where do you see Redmond fitting in once people are, are back? It, it, do you see him, you know, I, I think, and you could correct me if you, if you don't agree with this, but that Stuart Armstrong is on the right. That's his position. That, that position on the left could be Minamino. It could be Ginepo. It could be Redmond. Uh, and, and then the, 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 the spot up top, there's, it's likely to be Ings when, once he's back, but, but who, who fills in or where do you think Redmond fits in that kind of uh, rotation? Yeah, it's an interesting question because you can apply it to Nathan Teller pretty much exactly the same. And True. that's something that, that I asked Ralph um, after the Sheffield United game because Teller was brilliant, brilliant that day, really, really good. And it was a case of where's his best position now because he played it as a number 10 against Leeds and was probably the best player on the pitch. Then he played as a striker against Sheffield United and was probably the best player on the pitch. So, mm-hmm. I mean, what's the plan with this kid? And, and, and Ralph kind of said the front four positions are so flexible that he wants players who can play. I mean, apart from Che Adams and Danny Ings, I guess, he wants those guys who can play number 10 to be able to play in all four of the forward positions. Okay. Um, so he, he's open to that flexibility. And I don't think that is a case of putting square pegs in round holes. I think it's a case of that the four positions are actually pretty similar. Normally, Che stays up top and Redmond comes deep and comes inside and the, the number 10s move about and they join the attack and they drop back it's just how the system works so yeah. Teller can be good in all of them and I think Redmond can be good in all of them as well he, he can definitely play as number 10 I mean it's where we've seen him doing some of his best work with Bertrand on that left side so and he can play as a striker yeah. which is only a bonus um, it's only a bonus if when Danny Ings or Chalams pick up injuries that, that another another player can step in and, and I think we've seen this season how important depth is and quality and depth too not just having 19 year olds and 18 year olds who aren't good enough adding the depth it's good to right. have depth so a big a big box ticker for any depth charts is having redmond who can be an option as a striker and as a number 10 and i think yeah. Teller's the same i think they've both got a similar problem but they can i think they can both play both there's enough flexibility i think in that front four uh yeah and obviously the, we've had this kind of run of fixtures just being really compact and, and everything else and hopefully as we go through the final kind of uh, few game weeks of the season we can see some consistency in the lineup and, and the performances is I think what we're all hoping for. And this kind of wondering what saints you're going to get or what kind of confidence they're going to have. Um, it's been frustrating, but uh, you understand it because they're all kind of going, going through these things. But um, yesterday Redmond dropped deep a couple of times and was able to turn um, and, and run. And I was really impressed with uh, especially, I think, I mean, the finish for the goal was great. The, the first one, actually both finishes were great in, in different ways, but I was kind of, I think, more impressed with the his decision when running with the ball for the assist. Um, you know, he dropped a little bit deeper, picked up the ball, turned, ran, and kind of just allowed the Bournemouth defenders to kind of suck to him, I think. And then kind of, I, I think it was outside of the foot pass, just played uh, Janebo through. Um, I think that was that was my favorite part of the game. I think is just watching that. Um, but, but for you, I mean, there were also moments where he kind of seemed like old Nathan Redmond or, or, you know, a different, different game, Nathan Redmond where, where things didn't quite go well. So I, I think for you, what, what stood out to you about his performance yesterday? What moments were there both good and bad? Yeah, I think that, that pass is what had the, the kind of journals in the press box talking as well, because that's what's been missing. I guess it's, it's really easy to, to kind of, look at the goals and the finishes, but it's that final ball that's been missing. Yeah. Um, the movement has been there. Even against Brighton, the movement was kind of there. It was just the final ball, the final pass, or the final shot that just wasn't there in those, in those moments when they needed it to go their way. Um, and it's keeping it's keeping cool. Something that's quite interesting that Ralph said earlier in the season is about, about Che Adams not scoring goals. And 
about his his heart rate being so high, and that seemed a strange thing to say at the time. But they all run a lot. So that can run a lot. Um, being cool in those moments must be a lot harder when you're completely out of breath and your tank's running on empty already. Mm-hmm. Um, it's no excuse. Jalen should still be putting balls and putting chances in the back of the net, especially some of the golden chances he's had in recent weeks. But um, having the composure and the, the, the ability to pick a pass like that after a, a dart and run forward when you've already been pressing with your manager yelling press 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 at you for the first 35 minutes of the game is what sets a good player away from a great player and he was a great player yesterday because in those big moments he he delivered the, the pass and and the two the two finishes the second finish as well I don't think it's been spoken about enough it's easy to look at the the first goal where he puts it right in the top corner that second goal where it comes back off the post and straight into his feet it comes in really quick mm-hmm. And he adjusts his feet quick and he puts it in the, the only part of the goal where the keeper's not going to get to it. Yeah. It's a really good finish. And I think that should probably get a little bit more credit as well. Yeah, no, it was. And I was almost going to be critical because when I saw the ball come off the post, it didn't look like he was ready to, like he was anticipating. Like Ward Prowse took a step towards it. I think he was offside anyway. So I'm glad he didn't get anywhere near it. But he was at least looking to react. Redmond almost looked like he was flat footed, but he sorted his feet out and just kind of, yeah, I think it was, just first touch, right? Like one, one touch into the, into the, to the far corner. It was, uh, you know, smooth. It, I mean, it would have been really easy to just put that into the stands. And, and I think Nathan Redman, depending on you flip a coin, what, what finish happens? Does it, does it go into the stands or does it go into the corner? And uh, when he hit it, you could see the, his reaction was just like, you know, yes. And at that point, I'm sure he's not worried about man of the match performances, but he had to know he had it at that point, I think. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's confidence as well. I tweeted when he scored his, is because he'd already he'd already played the ball to Moose and then he scored his, his his solo run and I tweeted I think confidence was the first was the first word of the tweet because if he hadn't have done those before he probably would have took a touch for that yeah. second goal he probably would have tried to control it maybe look up for a pass but he was confident he he swung his foot at it and it went in the bottom corner and I think sometimes that's something that you only do when you've got confidence and and attackers who don't have confidence especially wide attackers as well when your whole game is about having the confidence to run at people and. Out, outpace people and knock the ball past people and run beyond them. It's it's such a confidence driven position of the pitch, yeah. And just having the confidence of, of what he did in that first half is what led to that next goal. And hopefully that stays because I think I've already touched on what Ralph said about him. He doesn't want him to be a one game a year player. He wants him to be a one game a week player. And it does seem that now that his physical fitness is all there, it's just confidence. It's just believing how good he really is. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the second goal real quick. Uh, Redmond's first, but. Um... Bournemouth had gone down. Uh, Vestergaard had tried to see the ball out. Solanke kept it in. And then nothing came from it, but we kind of went down the other end fairly quickly. And it looked like I, if we would have gone into halftime at 1-0, I would have said, okay, it's a solid performance. It's kind of what we would, I think we would have expected from Saints given the performances over recent weeks. Like we wouldn't probably have expected much more than that. But the fact that um, we get that throw in, Stu does the, the shoulder, whatever that is, um, I, you know, it always surprises me when people do that still. Um, and then Redmond just kind of took the ball and, and went for it. And there was no, there was no hesitation. It was just like, you, he, it, it's like, he looked at who was defending him and said like, I may be 27, but this guy's 106 and like, I'm just going to beat him. And then there was no chance. And once he made that decision, like, I think that that's the confidence. Maybe, for, maybe that comes from having that, that ball played through and he knew he made the right decision then. And just like, I'm going to do this. And then that finish was was gorgeous and then i mean after that is i think the the game was basically over um i don't think i think that would have just deflated bournemouth uh and given us a lift going into halftime but um i was just really impressed once again with the the confidence and the decision making to to run at people and i think you know that's what we want to see and and i went on the oh when the saints podcast uh yesterday just after the match uh, and that would have been out um yesterday when people hear this so on monday but we we kind of talked about it a little bit. Just you know, he didn't know why he wasn't running at people, and and you mentioned it as well. And and just that that idea that you know I'm going to do this, and now you know I I don't know I don't even know how to really explain it, but it just makes me feel so good to watch him do that. And and just you could see after he scored too the the elation on his face and everything else. It's just confidence. I mean, Southampton fans saw it with all them years ago with Gareth Bale. We we see it with young players a lot when they step into first team football. And they realise that they are better than the people around them. They get better and better and better. And I think Redmond needs to remember that he's better than players around him. We saw it against Bournemouth. He knew he was better than those Bournemouth defenders. So he knew that if he ran at them, he was going to cause them big problems. 
especially Steve Cook. I mean, he's got a hell of a lot more pace than Steve Cook and he absolutely sat him down. So it's just those moments. It really is such a confidence driven position. Yeah. Um, and then he took the goal, took the goal really well. And, and there is, there is nothing more he could have done in that position. And I think uh, one of the points I was I didn't I was trying to make, and I didn't do a good job of it was, you know, you could almost see people start to say now is Nathan's level is Redmond's level somewhere between too good for the championship, not quite there for the premier league. And I think that's, you can make that argument, but I think a confident Nathan Redmond is good enough for the premier league. A, a Redmond with no, with no confidence is probably not quite good enough for the championship, right? Like he's got, it's the confidence that is the, the deciding factor and how, how far he can go in his career. And I think you could, you could see in, in certain things like he, he, at times he just didn't look happy over the last couple of seasons. He just, you know, whether it's home things, whether it's, it's just, you know, performances or not enjoying your work. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced that there. Sometimes you just like, you know, it, it feels like you've written 3000 words and you've written 300 and they all suck. And like, I've been there with, with podcasts. It just is the way it goes. And you know, it just is the way things go with work. But um, you yeah, know, I just hope, you know, if he's enjoying it, I think he's, he has the confidence and in, in his, everything is better about his play than when he's, when he's not doing it. So hopefully that, that, that works out in our favor. Yeah. They're, they're human beings. And it's, it's one of the big things that it's one of the big things that, you know, is doing this job in a way when you speak to them one on one, they're human beings. I mean, even speaking to Kyle Walker Peters um, before this Bournemouth game, they're in lockdown. He gets home from training. He sits and plays on his Xbox and plays GTA with, with, Dom Nick Solanke, who plays with Bournemouth, they sit down together and they just play GTA on like They're just human beings. Yeah. So they go through good spells and bad spells. They go through happy times at home and sad times at home. And that, that, that does affect their work. And I think, like we said with Redmond, it really is just, just a confidence thing. And it's not just down to him. I think it can be down to the manager a little bit as well. I mean, managers like Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp and, and, and top managers like that, they, they put their players out on the pitch and, every player thinks they're the best player in the world because mm -hmm. that's what the manager puts in their heads. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why Ralph has been working so closely with, with Nathan Redmond over the last week, getting him running at people in training, knowing that he can, he has to harness those, those key strengths. And yeah, he's got another two weeks now to work with him closely and he'll work with all of them, all of the lads that don't go away for international duty. He'll work with them all closely and look to, look to, harness what they're good at and make sure that they, they carry that into the next run of Premier League games. I think we're heading into an April now, but I mean, I think back to the start of March and the, the questions that I was asking Ralph Harsen who all back then was that this is a huge March. You've got huge Premier League games and then you've got that huge game against Bournemouth. This is a defining month for your season. Now looking at April, this April is even bigger. Now it's, it's even bigger Premier League games. And then another big FA Cup game but this time it's at Wembley and it's a semi-final it's twice as big as the Bournemouth game so yeah confidence is going to be huge and Ralph needs to make them feel like they're all the best player in the world as they head into it yeah yeah and we'll have to kind of see how it goes we have we have a couple of questions and, and we'll kind of move towards wrapping this up and you have a you have an FA Cup draw to cover uh and that's a, a pretty good transition uh one of the patrons uh, Tim Bizantz asks us to rank the order of our preferred FA Cup match matchup. Um, and right now, Chelsea and Sheffield United are in the 80th minute. It's one nothing uh, to Chelsea. Manchester City beat Everton yesterday. I think we're ball number two in the draw. Um, so I, I guess from from the the opponents you would most want to the opponents you would least want. Uh, Southampton to draw later today, and people will already know this. But we can prove how wrong our predictions are. Uh, but but who who would you most like to see Southampton draw uh, in in the next round? This could be controversial. I really want Manchester United. They have got a lot to prove against that Manchester United side after what happened. And when I think back to some of the big games this season, I think back to that Liverpool game at the start of January and the narrative that Ralph had never beaten Jurgen Klopp and they went out on that pitch and the emotion at full time. Um, we all remember the Leicester game beating Leicester after the 9-0 and how big that was. Um, and yeah, if we were to beat Manchester United at, at Wembley, the same season that we lost 9-0 to them at their place, it would, for me, completely underline the last few months and, and put it right in the past. 
Mm. Um, it would completely put this terrible run behind us. Um, it would signify and signal to everybody that that's over. We can beat the best of the best because mm. there's no bigger hurdle than beating the team who gave you a pasting like that. Yeah. I think for me, what I really wanted out of um, the round, the round where we drew Bournemouth, obviously that's that's probably the matchup you want given either them or Sheffield United. Um, but I actually was hoping Leicester City and Manchester United would stay apart in the draw because I wanted both of them on the way. I wanted one in the semifinal, one in the final because there are things to prove. And I think we we proved against Leicester City last season when we put it behind us and we went back and beat them and and that was great. Um, but yeah, I would, uh, you know, we, there, there's a little, there's a the bad taste in, in a lot of Saints fans mouths about our, our matchups with Manchester United, uh, just from, from the League Cup final, uh, from the fact they took Carl from us. Um, and then of course the 9-0, like that's all, those are all things that, that we, we would like to, to, to put in the past and, and put away. And so I think for me, um, if I could pick a team to meet in the final, it would be United, but we have to get through the next round and. I mean, City is, is ridiculously tough. It looks like Chelsea are going to beat Sheffield United, even though it's only one nothing. Um, but but Tuchel's got them playing uh, defensively very good. Uh, offensively, I I mean that could be a, just an absolute disaster of a team if, 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 if to face, you know, uh, with the number of attacking uh, options they have. So um, I I feel like all of those teams will be hoping to draw ball number two uh, when when the draw comes out. And it would also be nice to to be the team that prevented Man City from from winning four trophies in a season, assuming they're going to to go and do that. So um, I think I don't know. I think I'd take United, the the winner of United uh, Leicester City probably. If we we're looking to get to the final, I think that has to be the one. I don't really want to face Chelsea or City uh, or Manchester City right now. I don't know. That's that, that's a tough question. Thanks, Tim, for completely ruining the podcast. Um, I've definitely got I've got it in the same order as you. Uh, okay. I've definitely got the winner of Man United Leicester at the top. For the same reasons that we just spoke about i think chelsea um we've shown that we necessarily won't lose to chelsea the minamino game um but thomas tuchel still annoyed about that he spoke about it a few weeks later in in the press after uh, i can't remember what game it was there was there was a game when he was asked about how his how flawless his start had, had been at chelsea and he said oh no i've got one big regret that we didn't beat southampton that was a, that was a frustrating game so He'll have stayed awake a lot of nights thinking about what went wrong against Southampton. So I'd imagine he's now got an answer to that, which yeah. is a bit scary. Um, Man City, I mean, it's Man City. I, I don't, I wouldn't want to go through that again. Um, I think Man United was a one-off game, but the City game at the Etihad, um, I thought we were really good throughout the whole game. I thought we played really well, but watching that game up close, um, it's the first time I've, I'd ever watched Pep City. Uh, live and the change of pace was terrifying the quality of Mares even was was terrifying it was they, they had the ability to pass it around at the back and then like a light bulb just switch it on it all move the every pass would be perfect every shot was perfect it was just so good so so good to watch and I, I don't want to be on the receiving end of that again um yeah. ideally it would have been Sheffield United but as, as you just said it looks like they're they're bowing out. So um, to, I guess to wrap up this question, we did ask Ralph about this yesterday, who he wants, and he just said, you've got to beat a big boy if you want to win the FA Cup. So Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, I mean, the, it's not going to get easy, right? It, this, is, this is, we've had a, I don't want to say we had an easy run, but we, get, we did get a, a good draw in this one. And, and I did just want to mention before we kind of finish this is, you know, there were jokes on Twitter about the Bournemouth fans, the, you know, all 12 of them, all 12 years old, lighting flares in the streets and, and saying this. And it seems like like Jack Wilshire and, um, and maybe Serge kind of took took that to heart and, and came in with some tackles that I didn't really or challenges. I wouldn't even call the one at the end of the game a, a tackle um, that that didn't quite fit the, the tone of the game. It's like uh, I think when Wilshire went in on Vestergaard. Like Vesper kind of just looked at him and was like, "What? Are you, like, what are you doing? Like, where? Where did that come from? You know, it doesn't. It, it had that been, you know, at night, down the road at, at Portsmouth, you know, on on that rainy evening when we went there, like the, that tackle goes in that night, then everybody's fired up, uh, and, and that's fine. It fits the tone of the game. I just didn't understand that coming from from Bournemouth yesterday, and and uh, you know, also a biggest shock of the day actually was not Nathan Redmond's finishing. Or his, or his decision making it was the fact that I found out that Jack Wilshire is only 29. Uh, I thought he was like 35 or something, um, but I, that was shocking to me. So, um, 
I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't even know. There's no question there. I don't think, but uh, I mean, was, well, actually, I guess it was. Uh, I was actually a little bit disappointed that when the ch- the challenge went in on Salisu, that was it was basically it was just a foul. Like it looked like he was trying to hurt him. Uh, similar to what Harry, Harry Kane did last week, I think. Uh, it was kind of drawn out, but I was a little bit disappointed that nobody stood up for Salisu at that point. I would have been much happier with Jack Stevens, who's probably not going to play a role in the next round, um, coming over and, and saying something and doing something. And I don't even care I, at that point, really, if he gets sent off for it, because I think you need to stand up for your teammates, um, especially when somebody, you know, we did just get punished for the, the, the Sheffield United thing with, uh, you know, there, there was, I guess, you know, shoving or whatever at the end of the game when, when Che Adams was the, I think at the, at the on the receiving end of a challenge and Vestergaard took exception to it, but I would have preferred that, I think. Um, but what about, what about you? What was said in the, in the press box, I guess, when, when that was going on? It wasn't really talked about too much, to be fair. I think if, if it wasn't a, a moment of the game where the situation was quite cool, it probably would have got a reaction. Um, I, I was about to mention before you did about how I'm sure James Ward-Prowse probably would have, would have, Throwing himself in, got involved in that if it wasn't for the Sheffield United fine that had just come come before them. Um, we, we've spoken quite a lot to Hasnil about being nasty in those situations because anyone who's watched football over years and years has seen that it, it's there's nothing more annoying sometimes than being a nice team playing against a team who isn't so nice and they're crowding the ref and they're getting used to yellow cards and and they don't seem to be punished for it. And I think a lot of people do want to be um want to be a, a nasty team yeah. and we asked Ralph about that after Leeds because Leeds were nasty yeah um and he said that he during his time with um with Ingolstadt in in Germany he made them a nasty team they were the nastiest team in in the Bundesliga they they crowded the ref they were pulling off silicon flowers they were picking up yellow cards here there and everywhere they were horrible and he hated it he said it, it just was horrible that isn't how he thinks football should be Football should be a nice sport. He didn't see it like that, and he said it. It really grinded him down playing football like that. So he's not yeah. going to ever do that again. So I don't think we'll ever see Southampton being that team. I think if Yannick was on the pitch at that point, he'd have been right next to it. And he's a, he's a big lad. I think he'd have got stuck in. Yeah. Um, but it was just a moment of the game. It was just a cool moment of the game, and I don't think that's anything to be too concerned about. Really. Yeah, it made me angry. I I, de- I generally don't go after players on Twitter, um, but that I mean, I just didn't see. We're, we're moments from full time. There's he doesn't do that face to face with with Salisu. So he doesn't do that to Vestergaard. He doesn't do that against other players. And I think he just obviously he's frustrated. His team are going out. He's not playing well. Um, you know he's 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 gotten some criticism from his own fans. I think. Um, but you know it, it was one of those things. I just I just didn't appreciate. And I, you know, I don't know. I. Not that I want people to get in fights or anything like that, but I would have, I would have probably accepted it in the moment yesterday. Um, and I'm not a confrontational person, but um, it's, just, it's just the way it goes. Um, it is a derby to them, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we saw with the fans before the game. It is a derby to them. And even speaking to Andrew Sermon in, that, in the build-up, um, trying to get you know, the view of someone who's played over 100 games for both clubs, he, or he said Eddie Howe always saw it as a derby when he was in charge there. So... You know, I guess it's a bigger game to them than it is than it is to to us. And in the dressing room before the game, I'm sure yeah. if you could be a fly on the wall in there, they'd have been Jonathan Woodgate. I'm sure would have been egging it up as you know, this is the big game of the season. This is our our rivals. This is a derby. So, you know, maybe you can excuse it a little bit, but definitely not that instant at the end. It's just one of those. I mean, it's, yeah. it's interesting you can face the Harry Kane one because Harry Kane gets away with them all the time, and he does he does very similar very similar challenges. Yeah, and you can kind of uh, you can see. If they felt it's a big game, they felt it's a derby. The, the way they started, they started, you know, initially they they had the ball down and in the box, you know, inside the first minute, um, and it took us a little while to get into it. And it's got to be even worse for them because we don't see it that way. So it's almost like, you know, they're like the little the little cousin who wants to, you know, who's who's had enough and wants wants a piece of of the big cousin. They're like, they're like I'm not even paying attention to that, you know. Uh, so it's got to be almost uh, patronizing a little bit to to them, but. Anyway. And I've got, I've got, to, I've got to sympathise with that a little bit because, I mean, covering Coventry City down in League One at the time, Cobb's biggest rivals, Aston Villa up in the Premier League, Leicester City up in the Premier League, they don't care about Coventry. Yeah, so, yeah. In a, in a way, it's a very similar situation to that. But it's interesting you mentioned Bournemouth's Bournemouth's good start because something else that we've not even touched upon that I was really impressed with yesterday with Southampton was. That early goal that was ruled out where 
Carl Walker Peters got in and behind, and his his cross, I think it was, got deflected into the far corner. We've seen that happen a lot to Southampton in recent weeks, those disallowed VAR goals, right or wrong. Um, and there's been a period after them where they've looked a little bit defeated. They've, they've Their heads have dropped. They've not really responded to those moments that well. Um, yesterday, I thought they responded to it really well, which is a big sign, a really big promising you know, sign to look at going, going forward because it, over the last few weeks, if they hadn't have responded so negatively to some of those moments, they'd have picked up points that they didn't pick up. So if they can just carry that mentality going forward, that, that never give up mentality, then you know, that, that there's going to be enough points picked up to get them well clear of relegation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we've had a, a kind of a lot of questions on um, on Redmond's performance, which I think we talked about. So thanks to Kevin for for getting that. And you know, it is important for Redmond, both in terms of his confidence and for our confidence in him. One game won't turn the fans, I don't think, but um, hopefully one game will turn him, and that will you know bring along the fans who are on the fence. Uh, some people on Twitter are never going to come to his to, to, to like him, and that's that's their that's their business. Uh, we talked about the order of the FA Cup match. Um, and I don't know if Redmond will be able to maintain that form, especially like maybe one negative is that we we have some time off for people to recover from injuries. Ings is expected to be back, but we could pick up more injuries. We've talked, uh, you know, Stuart Armstrong's come back from Scotland injured before, so hopefully that that's not the case. And hopefully Che going, uh, which I think is good, and I wrote about in the newsletter this week, uh, is good. But well, now we have to wait, uh, so maybe the momentum, we don't get to carry it over, but you know, winnable games, we'll get to it. Uh, the, the last question comes from the In That Number podcast, and it says, uh, I appreciate this because they don't actually spell out Pompey. They use the, uh, the asterisk, which is good. That our Pompey and Bournemouth still uh, will say, we'll say crap. Um, and, and you're not even from, from Southampton. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? I, where, on the level, of, on the crap level of zero to 10, where are they? I've got to be very um, careful here. Yes, we because you don't answer that. Okay, things. that's an unfair question. <laughs> so I'll answer for you because uh, you can't say it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy for other people to speak there. Yes, yes. They're, uh, I, I, we will say yes, all of it. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, think, I, I think I've told the story before, but I, going from London to Southampton to watch uh, the, the England women's team play against Wales and that, that qualifier that was at St. Mary's, uh, we were on, the, on the, the train. You know, it's me, my wife, my kids. We're playing cards. The there are two people, two older people, uh, and and sure enough, you know they're going to Bournemouth, and they the, they were the nicest people. They put up with with the uh, you know the kids and us asking questions, and, and you know he was a season ticket holder at Bournemouth, and you know it's it's a nice little club, and it was the nicest thing of all time. And it's like look like that that looks nice, that's fine. Um, and then you know the twelve year olds decide that it's it's a big deal. So uh, you know I, it, it turned me a little bit. I was really I'm really unhappy about the that challenge at the end of the game on Salisu and. Um, I don't want it to change my perception of Bournemouth because I think it's it's a nice, it's a nice city. But uh, you know, s- screw them. Uh, the other guys down the road, I don't want to talk about. So four um, <laughs> 0 in your own backyard, I think is the the answer we have to that. But I want to say, I don't want to get you in trouble with that. So uh, I want to say thank you to you, Tom. Uh, if people want to follow you on Twitter, they can do that at Tom Leach um, HL, and the, and the links to that are in the show notes. Links to Hampshire Live are in the show notes. And I can, I can say that there's a lot of, you, you, like you said earlier, we talked about how busy kind of you are with, with uh, your content schedule and things like that. There's a lot there for people to get there, to get from the site and from you. Uh, so I would encourage people to do that. And I want to say thank you for, you know, you have one more job to do before you get a week off. And I want to say thanks for squeezing this in because amidst all the other things you have, including your driving, you got, um, you know, a-holes like me messaging you and say, hey, how about you give me, you know, an hour and a half of your time to talk about the stuff that you've probably already written about. So I appreciate it. And uh, just want to say thank you. No, brilliant. I see. I've really enjoyed it. I like doing this kind of stuff. Like I said at the start, it's nice to talk about it instead of writing about it. And also I always find things like this sometimes it's quite good to talk about it and, and kind of hear it back and listen to someone else talk about it too, because you just spoke earlier on in this about the demands of this job sometimes. And there's a lot of time with your own thoughts and yeah. kind of writing about Southampton. And sometimes you're only hearing your own opinion. Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm always on Twitter reading what other people think, but it is good to hear different sides from people who have seen the same thing as you have. So it's always yeah. good to keep it, you know, keep your mind open and it gives you ideas more than anything. It gives you different ideas of things to write about and 
we try and do so much content that having as much to write about sometimes is just the best thing possible. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, I want to say thanks again and hopefully uh, you'll be up for doing this again. Um, and you know, hopefully saints continue to play, continue to play well. Um, I was going to try to make a, a joke and say there's no relation to Adam. Right. But I think you guys' names are spelled. No, I get it. I get it a lot. Every, okay. um, I'm glad every I time know. I, every time I go into the, um, into the press thing, every time there's, someone different on the press desk at St. Mary's. It's always, oh, you related to Adam? Yeah. And I mean, it, that means nothing to me. I'd, I'd never heard of him before I moved out. I've, <laughs> I've, heard of him, I've heard of him a lot now, but yeah, it is. It's spelt, uh, I don't know who's, who's got it spelt the weirdest. I think we've, we've both got Leach spelt wrong, I guess in the normal way is E-E, but yeah. I, I'm E-A and he's, I think he's E-I-T, is he? Yeah, yeah, I think so, it's different. So. Yeah, a lot of ways to spell it wrong and I think we've both got it wrong. Well, uh, you know, he had a, a very long career uh, covering Saints, and and still gets to do it with the, uh, the with the club on their on their match day for stuff now, and and uh, he's a great dude. So, um, anyway, and, and as are you. I, I've never met either one of you in person, but hopefully one of these days. Uh, I, although if I fly over there, I'm probably not coming to Coventry City. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, it's probably not the vacation spot I'm looking for, but um, you know, you never know. So uh, I want to say thanks again. And we'll do this again. And um, yeah, have a, enjoy your break and, and have a great week. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, just let me know. And we'll, uh, yeah. And that does it for this week's episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Special thanks this week goes out to Tom Leach. You can find him on Twitter at Tom Leach HL. Uh, links to his articles and to Hampshire Live are in the show notes. There's a lot to, to get into on the site, so uh, hopefully you enjoy it. And I always enjoy talking to uh, people who come to the club to cover the club, especially people who are, are new to doing that. It is, is uh, something that I enjoy, so hopefully you enjoy it as well. As I mentioned previously, the show has surpassed 100,000 downloads, and that is all thanks to you for listening, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you also to the Southampton page and to the Saints Archive for partnering with the show and for helping spread the word about it. Uh, I really do appreciate it, and I appreciate you especially putting up with uh, the time differences and uh, you know all, all of those things that make it difficult to work with me personally. Uh, I just really do appreciate it. So uh, thanks to all of you, and uh, hopefully you know many more listens. On each of those episodes that has been released so far, Matt Beeling has done the artwork for the show. You can find him on Instagram at We Are Southampton. If you don't already follow the page, you should do so. They make my photos and things like that look like uh, kids drawing with crayons with their offhand. All music for this show comes courtesy of the Free Music Archive at freemusicarchive.org. The intro song is Epic Song by Box Cat Games, and the end of show credits you listen to right now is Aim is True by Poddington Bear. We're off to the international break, but we will have something for you next week. And of course, we'll be back after that as well. And uh, until next time, remember that together, we march on. Mm-hmm.